All right, turn with me to Matthew 16. We are still in Matthew 16. Uh, again, in many ways, this is a very pivotal chapter for Jesus and the 12 disciples. Um, he's in about the last six months of his earthly ministry. He's been you know, ministering for about three years. And the first three years were amazing in so many ways. He was demonstrating the fact that he was, is the Messiah. Uh, he's the one sent from God from heaven to earth. And that was the primary purpose of his ministry was to come from heaven to earth to prove to the masses of people that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and so we've seen Matthew quote many Old Testament scriptures proving who Jesus is, showing us he has fulfilled one prophecy after another. He's been doing one miracle after another amazing miracle. But now Jesus begins preparing his disciples for, again, the main reason why he came from heaven to earth, and that was to be the final sacrificial lamb of God who would go to the cross. He would redeem us from our sins by dying in our place, shedding his blood for our sins. Jesus will do, uh, he'll still do some miracles as we finish out the gospel of Matthew, but not to the same scale as what we have been seeing. And, and again, the primary reason why is he really starts to focus more on his disciples. He's going to be discipling his disciples. And so we left off with Jesus telling the disciples, uh, I must go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be, you know, betrayed into the hands of evil men. I will suffer at the hands of the religious leaders. I will be crucified. I will rise again from the dead. He made it very clear, but that's when we saw last time Peter steps in. And he says, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. In other words, Peter was trying to tell Jesus, you don't have to go to Jerusalem and die. I've seen the power you have. You can come against anybody. You don't have to be defeated by anybody. And so Jesus immediately rebuked Peter. And this is what we left off in verse 23. But get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. In other words, Peter was clueless as to why Jesus came from heaven to earth. He's still thinking worldly. You're mindful of the things of men. Well, the people wanted to take Jesus by force and make him king, but that's not the purpose why he came. Again, he did not understand Jesus must die, shed his blood, rise from the tomb, and only then could that stranglehold of sin and death be removed from those who come to Jesus Christ by faith. As we get further into Matthew's gospel, he um, will show us, and it becomes more obvious, that none of his disciples understand what Jesus is talking about until after his resurrection. They're still arguing, they're still debating, and are you going to set up the kingdom of God now? And, and they didn't understand it until Jesus left and the Holy Spirit filled them up overflowing. And so right after Jesus rebukes Peter, and he kind of puts him in his place, we pick up in verse 24. Chapter 16, 24, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So this is in context of instead of being mindful of the things of men, we're to be mindful of the things of God. And so, if you want to come after me, he says, you need to deny yourself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, when Jesus says, take up your cross, they knew exactly what he was talking about because they had seen many times the Roman emperor, empire putting people on crosses. They, that was their main form of execution. They would crucify thousands of people during the time and before Christ, even after Christ, they crucified people as criminals. And so when Jesus says, you got to take up your cross, they're, in their mind they're thinking, we have to die. That's what it means. We have to die. If anyone desires to come after me, if anyone says, I want to follow you, Jesus, then understand this. You're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to have to die to yourself and then follow me. This is where the proverbial rubber meets the road. Let's break this down a little bit. First, he says you have, you have to deny yourself. Denying self is very different than self-denial. 
A lot of religious people practice self-denial. A lot of world religions, Hindus and Buddhists and a lot of them, they practice self-denial, thinking that if I don't do these certain things, if I don't eat certain things, then I'll become more righteous, then I'll become more holy. If I stop eating this, if I stop doing that, I become more holy and righteous. No, that's self-denial. Very different than denying self. Self-denial is not always bad because most of us practice self-denial in some form or another. Anytime you want to lose weight, you got to practice a little self-denial, right? You know, we're trying to stop a bad habit. We put into practice self-denial, but that's not denying yourself. In this context, Jesus is saying you've got to stop living for yourself and you've got to start trusting me, living for me. That's when we find true freedom because that's when our flesh is no longer you know, keeping us in bondage, when we're dying to our flesh, denying our flesh. Self-denial is all about self. Denying ourselves in this context is all about crucifying sinful flesh, following after Jesus. Again, it's not always easy. I, I want to live life my way. I mean, that's what most of us try to do. But Jesus says, no, Jeff, if you want to be my disciple, you got to stop living life your way. You need to start living life my way. You need to deny yourself. You need to die to yourself. You need to follow me. And that's when we experience his resurrection power. We need to deny ourselves, take up our cross, die to our flesh whenever our flesh starts to swell up within us. And you know when those temptations come, you have a choice to make. Am I going to give in to that sin or am I going to deny myself and say, Not my will, Lord, your will be done. This is what Paul had in mind when he wrote 1 Corinthians 1.18 where Paul says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are, notice, being saved, that's in the present tense, ongoing, this is part of the sanctification process. Yes, we're complete in Christ. We've been justified. We will be glorified. But right now, we are being saved in the sanctification process. To us who are being saved, it, the cross, is the power of God. That's because when we're taking up our cross in a particular area of our lives, that is when we'll experience the resurrection power of Jesus giving the strength to resist the temptation, to resist the lie of the enemy that comes our way. This is more important than ever, especially in this crazy political environment in which we are living. So often we think, well, the church will be able to accomplish so much more if we just have a red wave yeah, I hope we have a red wave, but that's not what we're living for. We're living for Jesus, not for Washington, D.C. You think about the political climate when Jesus came from heaven to earth. It was brutal beyond any of our able to comprehend what they were experiencing. And think about what Paul said about God's timing in sending Jesus from heaven to earth. This is what he says in Galatians 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. But that phrase, when the fullness of time had come. In other words, in God's perfect time, his timing, he sent Jesus at just the right moment into this sinful world. And this world back then was in a great big mess in every way. They didn't have any First Amendment rights. You speak against Rome, you're dead. They didn't have any Second Amendment rights. That's not your spear. You can have a spear. We're going to take that spear away from you. You could have a little dagger like Peter whacking off Malchus's ear. You can't have a spear. Only the Romans could have a spear. We're going to take that away or put you to death. Jesus is going to get crucified for what he was doing. All of the apostles, but John, would be killed in horrendous ways. They would be burned. They would be crucified upside down. They'd be tortured. They would go through brutal things. Listen, Jesus did not come into a pleasant environment. And he didn't try to change the political environment. There's a balance in this. Yes, we want good people in office, but that's not our hope. 
Our hope always has to be in Jesus. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was, my servants would fight. That's what he told Pontius Pilate. That's not why he came. But he came into a world that was broken and empty, where religion had left people feeling hopeless. And people were getting nothing from religion. But they saw the light of Jesus. They saw his love. They saw his compassion. They experienced his grace and mercy. And multitudes of people turned to Christ. In fact, for the next 300 years, 313 years, after Jesus died, rose again, ascended, the church was under tremendous persecution. There was 10 Roman emperors, and they persecuted the body of Christ like mad, like crazy, starting with Caesar Nero. They would put Christians and pale them on posts after dipping them in tar, set them on fire. They would put Christians into the Colosseum there in Rome. They would turn loose on them lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. I mean, they did horrible things. That's not even funny. I mean, I don't know why I said it, but anyway. They, they would behead Christians. They crucified multiple Christians. Six million followers of Jesus over those 300 years were put to death for their faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only reason they died. Not, they, they weren't criminals just because of their faith in Christ. And here we are today. Yes, our world is a big, messy place. I don't like it, but we've still got it pretty good. You know, I can still go home, grab something out of the fridge, throw something on the barbecue, flip on a game. You know, we've got it pretty simple. And a lot of Christians think, that's what we all want. Get back to normal. Keep it coming, Lord. Keep blessing me, and then I'll be a witness for you. Really? I think it's in times of hardship and struggles and trials that we have more opportunity to share Christ with those around us because they're feeling hopeless. And there's a lot of people since the last two years with COVID and everything, they're feeling pretty hopeless. And we need to be about the Father's business. We need to be letting people know that Christ loves them. He died on the cross for their sins. He wants to give them eternal life. But it's always been when people are hurting and broken without hope that they tend to want to hear the gospel of Christ. So even though the environment is not necessarily ideal in our country right now, we need to have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. I mentioned this first service, um, March 19th on a Saturday. So I forgot what it meant, Evangel evangelism explosion. Some of you have heard of that. D. James Kennedy, he passed away 15 years ago, uh, started a ministry called Evangelism Explosion. It's just learning how to share your faith, like in a minute. You know, you can go to anybody, you know, and talk about Jesus, lead him to the Lord. Many people get saved that way. They've seen like 20 million people come to Christ through evangelism explosion. We did something similar about 20 years ago here. Some of you might remember sharing Jesus without fear, uh, Bill Fay out of Denver. And it's just basically a tool, how to share your faith, and very simple. Uh, Jubilee, I went, uh, Jesse and I went to a luncheon a week ago Friday, and it was really good. You know, I got to hear from some of the leaders of the ministry. And I was a little leery at first because back then it was be it was like a program. You just say the magic words, boom, they're going to accept Christ. No. No, they understand. No, it's got to be the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God that will bring that conviction into people's hearts. So you're, anybody, everybody's invited. On March 19th, we'll have more information about this. It's like an all-day thing. It's going to be a Jubilee Family Church, and um, there's a lot of neat pastors I get to reconnect with when I was there. So anyways, keep that in mind, um, sharing Jesus just out of humility, with love for the lost. And so we have opportunities. Anyway, where was I going with that? Um, we need to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying as He directs us to minister to those who need Jesus. So a great section of Scripture that tells us how we are to live right now, presently, as Christians, we find this in Romans 12, starting in verse 9. I'm going to go through these verses slowly and let the Lord use these to minister to you, to show you, challenge you. Am I living this way? Let love be without hypocrisy. Romans 12, 9. Abhor what is evil. So we should not, you know, think, oh, they're sinful. Oh, that's okay. They're consenting adults living in sin. Oh, that's wonderful. No, abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. 
in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. I don't want to slap them upside the head. Lord, what are you saying? No, bless those who persecute you. We saw that back in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. So we see you know, ministry to unsaved, ministry here to saved. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. I don't get that guy. No. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. I love this. If it is possible, emphasize if, because it's not always. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Again, we can't live that way. We can't be this kind of a believer in our own strength. We need to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. In, in uh, Luke 9.23, he says, take up your cross daily. It's an ongoing thing. This is why we must deny ourselves and walk in the power of the Spirit. So here's Jesus telling Peter, you're rebuking me. You're telling me, Peter, not to go to the cross, but I'm telling you, if you want to follow me, if you want to be my disciple, you're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to have to take up your cross. You're going to have to die to yourself. Then you can follow me. There are many verses that speak of the fact that as his followers, we have been crucified with Christ. You know, you can read Romans 6. It talks about reckoning the old man dead. We've been buried in his baptism, raised up in newness of life. But there's many verses that talk about the fact that we have been crucified with him. But we also need to continually crucify our flesh when it tries to rise up. Galatians 2.20 is kind of how Paul sums it up. Look at this verse. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So that's a great um, example of what Jesus is telling us here. I've been crucified with Christ, no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, in this body, I live by faith in Him, trusting Him, walking with Him, listening to Him through the Word of God. Now look at verse 25. That was quite the introduction. No. <laughs> we got one verse down. Verse 25. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now what Jesus says here is so opposite of the world of the unsaved people. The unsaved are trying to do everything imaginable to try to extend their life, try to hold on to their life. They don't want to die, even if they get to be 100 years old. they got to hang on because they don't have any hope of eternity. They don't know what's in store. You know, we know, my wife and I know somebody that... The mother was basically in a coma for like three years, and they, the daughter could not let her mom go, and the mom, nothing there. But they weren't believers, and just holding on to this life because, oh, if they die, I don't know what's going to happen. We don't mourn as those who have no hope. We have tremendous hope in Jesus Christ. But so many are trying to hold on with everything. Hebrews 9.27 tells us, As it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. In other words, we're all appointed to death, but the big question is, do you know where you're going to go when you die? That's the all-important question. All of us will face eternity, but for those who reject Jesus, they will face eternity in the lake of fire. For those who receive Christ, we will spend eternity in His presence and glory. Everything that people do to try and save their own life will be useless. But as Jesus also tells us in this verse, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. 
In other words, you want to have real life, genuine life, eternal life, die to your own fleshly ambitions and say, here I am, Lord, use me, fill me. I want to live my life for your glory. And he, he will give you eternal life and he will use you. He who began a good work in you will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 26. This is something that all the Bill Gateses of the world <laughs> need to hear. Verse 26, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, whenever I hear some young person say, and I've heard it many times over the years, that I want to be a millionaire before I'm 25. I want to have $10 million in the bank before I'm 30. You know, I want to die with all. It's like, okay, you can die with it all, but you're not going to take it with you. My initial thought when I hear that from someone is, what profit is it to a person who makes one, ten, a hundred million dollars and they die without Jesus? It's no profit whatsoever. How tragic that is. Jesus says here in verse 26, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? The answer is you cannot give anything. You think God is impressed? You think like somebody like Bill Gates, hey God, I'll give you a billion dollars if you let me into heaven. You think God's going to be tempted by that? Absolutely not. The creator of the heavens and the earth, he's going to roll up the whole universe after the millennial reign of Christ. He's going to roll up the whole universe like a scroll, it says. He's going to vaporize it all. Second Peter 3, starting in verse 10, you read the rest of that chapter. It's all going to melt with fervent heat. There's not going to be anything left in the whole universe. But then he's going to create a whole new heaven universe, a whole new earth in which righteousness will dwell forever. Amazing. So you think you're going to tempt God by, hey, I'll give you something, God, to let me in. No chance. He's not impressed with any amount of money a lost sinner can offer him. Listen, only Jesus paid the price in full for all of us, for every sinner. And again, that perfect price was his perfect spotless blood. That's the only acceptable payment that the Father will accept. There's nobody who can buy it. There's nobody who can earn it. And certainly none of us deserve eternal life. But here's Jesus offering the free gift of everlasting life to anyone who will simply humble themselves, say, Lord, here I am. I, I receive you. You, di you died for me. You paid the price for my sins. And all I can do is receive you as my Lord and Savior. And he will save you. Now, at the same time, Jesus can and he has blessed us in all kinds of different ways. Nothing wrong with being materially blessed. Finance is just one way that he blesses us. But the important thing is, whatever God has blessed you with, we need to have a grateful heart, a thankful heart, knowing from whom we have received these blessings. James 1.17 he writes, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Paul also tells us um, in 1 Timothy 6.17, he's telling Timothy, command those who are rich in this present age, again, that would be all of us here compared to the rest of the world, not to be haughty or puffed up with pride, nor to trust in uncertain riches when the stock market collapses and everything's going down the tubes. We don't want to trust in uncertain riches. But here's where our trust is, in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. So this is why I like to say, make sure you keep a light touch on the things of this world because it's all going to burn. <laughs> Literally, so everything is going to burn at some point. You can't hang on to it. You can't take it with you. It's all going to burn. Again, read 2 Peter 3.10 on down. Look at verse 27. Jesus says, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He will reward each one according to His works. Now, this is a broad statement by Jesus here. When He mentions rewards for each one's works, there's two meanings behind this because we see in other places there's the rewards for His faithful followers, and then there's rewards for their works for the unsaved. And those rewards are not good. For followers of Christ, we know that salvation is a free gift, 
It's not a reward that any of us can earn. It's not a reward for anything we have done. But as followers of Christ, the Bible is clear that we have we will be rewarded by Jesus for what we do as Christians in the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember in 1 Corinthians 3, he said, Paul says there's one foundation laid, that is Jesus Christ. Then he says, take heed how you build on that foundation. You can build on it with gold, silver, or precious stones. Hay, wood, stubble. He's speaking to us as believers. All the gold, silver, precious stones of things that will last. Things that we have done in the power of the Holy Spirit will last throughout, throughout eternity. Things we do... Even good things we do in the power of our flesh because we want to be noticed, we want people to pat us on the back, God's going to not reward us for those things because hay, wood, and stubble. It's going to burn up. It won't. You won't be rewarded for any of those things. As for us, believers in Christ, this will all take place at the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. Don't be afraid of the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. This is a place only the bride of Christ goes to. Only Christians will stand before the Bema seat. Bema means the place of rewards. It's what the Olympic athletes, when they ran the you know, Olympic Games back in Athens back in those days, they would stand at the Bema and they'd be rewarded you know, for what they did. They'd get the crown, the laurel wreath and all those things to the winners, just like our gold, silver, bronze now. That's what they were rewarded at the Bema seat. They weren't judged, but they would give rewards for what they did, how they placed. Now, the first thing I believe that happens when Jesus comes for his church and the rapture takes place is we will stand before the Bema seat and he will burn off all the chaff from our lives. And the things that we're rewarded for, what do we do? Those crowns he gives us, we cast them at his feet because we know he alone is worthy. Then we're ready, though. That's when the bride of Christ is made ready, as Revelation 19 speaks of. The, the bride has made herself ready. It's after we go through the Bema seat, we're ready. We have the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's a, good, a glorious time. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, Paul says to believers, For we must all appear before the judgment seat, the bema seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, on the other hand, everyone who does not accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they will stand before a different throne, the great white throne, and it's a place you don't want to go to. Know what throne you're going to stand before now. Don't wait. If you don't know Jesus, this is one of the main reasons you want to get saved. Not just fire insurance. You just want to spend eternity with the Lord. But look at what happens here in Revelation 20, starting in verse 12. Speaking of the great white throne of God. And I, this is the Apostle John, seeing these things. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. By the way, this is after he destroys his present heaven and earth, after the millennial reign of Christ. It's all rolled up. There's nothing but this throne in outer space. I don't know how it looks. It's just in utter darkness, great white throne. And then all these people are raised up, dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. This is just what Jesus is telling us here. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Again, the bottom line is make sure you know which throne you're going to stand before. The second death, I can't remember who said it now, maybe D.L. Moody, one of those guys said, um, for us who are born twice, we will only die once. But those who are only born once will die twice. Understand that? For us who have been born twice. We were born naturally, now we're born again in Christ. We'll only die once, unless the rapture happens. Those who are born once will die twice, a natural death and then the second death, which is the lake of fire. Make sure you know which side you are on, which throne you're going to stand before, because both of those thrones lead to eternity. Eternity with Jesus or eternity separated from Him. 
Know this, Jesus paid the price. He alone can give eternal life. Verse 28. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Now, the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all quote Jesus saying this right before He takes Peter, James, and John up on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's what He's referring to. Some of you will not taste death till you see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. The word kingdom can also be translated to His royal splendor. And so right after he says that, the next scene is chapter 17, verse 1. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Um, We're not sure what mountain it is. It never tells us. Some think, you know, Mount Hermon. It's 9,200 feet, just north of where they are in Caesarea Philippi. That's a high mountain. I mean, there's other mountains people speculate, and it's like, that's only 1,800 feet. That's not a high mountain. Maybe, I don't know. We don't know where this happened. But we do know from Luke's gospel, when they get up there, Peter, James, and John were so tired, they fell into a deep sleep. So it must have been a pretty grueling hike up whatever mountain it was. Verse 2, And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light transfigured. This is awesome. The Greek word is metamorphu, which gives us metamorphosis. Jesus was metamorphosized. I guess that's a word. He was metamorphosized before Peter, James, and John. This was not light shining on Jesus, but this was light shining out of Jesus. Metamorphu means a change on the outside that comes from the inside. That's what he's doing. Transformation, trans, you know, uh, transitioning here, transfiguring from the inside out. Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verse 3 says, His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. Unless you go to India, they can get their shirts pretty white, but not like this. Luke says, His face was altered, transfigured, and then his clothes were bright and glistening. I don't know what that looks like. It's going to be awesome to see a replay of this. We've all seen, you know, how that humble little caterpillar crawls in the ground, it climbs up a tree, makes a little cocoon, and then out comes the beautiful butterfly. We call it a metamorphosis, change on the outside that came from the inside. That's the word used here. That's the word that's used for that butterfly changing into, or the caterpillar changing into a butterfly. Since you and I have been born again by the Holy Spirit of God, we are presently going through our own metamorphosis, a change on the inside that's coming to the surface. Hopefully, this is religion says, no, you change the outside, conform to these rules, rituals, and regulations, and then maybe that'll change you on the inside. No, that's impossible. God brings changes on the inside, and then it starts to come out of our lives. Since you and I have been born again, we're going through this process. Jesus is at work in our hearts, in our minds. He's doing it through the Holy Spirit of God and the Word of God. Here's a couple verses to take note of. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That means to take up your cross and follow Jesus. You're a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. And do not be conformed to the world, this world, but be transformed. Metamorpho, metamorphosis. Be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Who does that? The Holy Spirit taking the Word of God transforms our minds. We'll look at this later, too. That you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And then Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. That's in the present tense. We're being metamorpho. That's the word transformed. We're being changed into the same image 
of Jesus from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So he who began a good work in you will complete it. Hasn't happened yet. We're still in the transformation process. So Jesus is doing this work on the inside of us, but it's up to us to let Jesus work out of our lives. Remember what Paul says in Philippians 2, you know, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Not work for it, but work it out. For it is God who both wills to, and to do for His good pleasure. He's the one that's doing the work in you. He's the one that enables you to do the work for Him. And so we need to let out what He is doing inside of us. This is the main reason why we need to spend time in the Word of God, just soaking it in, because God's Word alone is living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. You can read all kinds of different books and commentaries and, you know, the whatever. Declaration of Independence, great, but that's not going to transform your heart and mind. Only Jesus can through the Word of God. And by doing this, that will also be a real blessing to other people around us, to our spouse, because they see more of Jesus, less of me. <laughs> around your friends, your you know family members, your neighbors, they see more of Jesus and less of us. Jesus wants to be emanating from our heart, so to speak. None of us are completely metamorphosized, if that's the right word, or morphed. We're not, we're still in process. All you have to do is look in the mirror. You're not what you used to be, but you're not what you're going to be when you stand in His presence in a glorified body. That takes place at the rapture when Jesus descends from heaven. The dead in Christ will rise first. And then Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, Then we who are alive and remain, could be if it happened today, that'd be us, shall be caught up harpazo, snatched away quickly, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. So he's revealing something that was previously unknown, but now it's, he's making it known. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. Praise the Lord. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. And so it's at the resurrection, the rapture, that we will be completely transformed by the Lord. Look at verse 3. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Now this is amazing, because here you have these two great figures from the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah. Moses represents the law of God. Elijah represents the prophets of God. And they appear on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. In Luke's Gospel, it says that the three of them, Jesus and Moses and Elijah, are talking about his decease or his departure. The word that Luke uses for decease, the Greek word is exodus. That's pretty cool because they're talking about his death, his resurrection, and that he'll lead captivity captive. He'll, he'll lead the greatest exodus of all, not just out of Egypt, but into glory. And so I'd love to hear that one. I want to get a replay of that. That's going to be amazing. Anyway, a side note here, I think you know, this is one of the reasons I believe Moses and Elijah are the two witnesses in Revelation 11, because they'll be there at the base of the Temple Mount. They'll be calling people out to repent. They're calling people to not listen to the Antichrist, don't take the mark of the beast, and they'll be put to death there in Jerusalem. Their bodies will lie in the th streets for three days, and God will raise them up to life. And it says the whole world will see that happen. Not just people down the street. Oh, wow, look at that. No, the whole world will see that happen. It can only happen in our lifetime through satellite TV and the rest of it. I think it's Peter, or Peter, I think it's Moses and Elijah. We know one of them is Elijah because the very last two verses in Malachi, the Old Testament, say Elijah's coming before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. 
their ministry, very similar to what Moses and Elijah did, calling fire down from heaven, stopping rain for three and a half years, and so forth. But be that as it may, it's at this time, they're talking to Jesus, and, and we're, when you put all three Gospels together, Peter, James, and John wake up, and they see this, and, and they're just blown away. Look at verse 4. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, little huts, tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. I love what Luke adds because Luke says, Peter, not knowing what to say, says this. Again, that's Peter. It's amazing that they instantly recognize, though, this is Moses and Elijah. That's interesting. They never had any photographs. You know, Moses and Elijah died hundreds and hundreds of years earlier, but they knew this was Mo Moses and Elijah. So, how did they know that? I don't know. It was a supernatural thing here. Verse 5, when he, Peter, was still speaking, he never knew when to shut up. I mean, you can see this a couple times, like with Cornelius, he's giving them the gospel, the first Gentiles get saved. It says, while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they all got saved. He never knew when to stop. So God interrupts him. So while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And so again, while Peter's still speaking... He's blurting out whatever is on his heart, whatever is on his mind. And it's like God just interrupts him and says, Stop talking, Peter. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Listen to Jesus. And instantly these three guys, the disciples, fall on their faces. Verse 6, And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. It means they were terrified. I mean, they're shaking in their sandals. I mean, they were just so just blown away. You think God got their attention? Oh, yeah. Verse 7. We'll wrap it up here. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. So in their state of being greatly afraid, because God tells them, Listen to my son Jesus, Jesus just touches them and says, don't be afraid, arise, get up. And when they look up, they don't see anyone but Jesus. Now that's a whole sermon in itself. Look up and see Jesus. In the midst of your pain, your trials, your discouragements, chaos of the world, look up and see Jesus. Whatever struggles you might be going through, look up and see nothing but Jesus. Only He can touch your heart. Only He can change your mind. Only He can bring you peace and comfort and reassurance that everything's going to be okay. He's on the throne and He's in control. Look up and see Jesus. I want to close with these verses out of Colossians. You know, Paul, I mean, you see so much of what Jesus taught in Paul's letters. Here's a great example. Colossians 3, starting in verse 1 says, if then you were raised with Christ, again, all of us who put our faith and trust in Him, we've been raised up as new creations, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. Kind of a hint at the rapture, because when Christ appears in glory, we are going to be with Him in glory. That's what happens at the rapture. We'll be changed, metamorphosized completely from these bodies of corruption to resurrection bodies that will dwell with Him forever and ever. So, more to see about this next time, Lord willing.